<laughs> All right, Captain John Doolittle, good to see you, my friend. Hey, it has been a long time, brother. Yeah, it has long been a long time. Your your uh your backdrop there kind of captures what uh what was really sort of fascinating for me to to bring you on the podcast is everything I can see, everything going on behind you there, lots of awards and and uh and just memorabilia that kind of capture your 20 25 years and five months. Is that what I saw? Right? Yeah, yeah, a little, little over 25 years, yeah. Before I before I dig into that, I want to tell because you, you've I've I've told your stories more times than I can count uh, about and and you set the tone for me as a as a young enlisted guy you set the tone for me for for and I, I'm not blowing smoke here for what a good leader looks like and I, I I I did 11 years in before I got my commission and when I became an officer in the teams I was like there's only a few handful of guys that I want to emulate myself after and and uh, John Doolittle was definitely one of them so. So it was really cool for me to have an opportunity to get in here and, Thanks, and kind of pick your brain about some leadership. Um, uh, one of the things is that it's always stood out to me, and I, I talked to another guy earlier, um, uh, John Timor, who's the CEO of uh, of Killcliffe. John was saying like we place too much emphasis on on academic and and, and pedigree and stuff like that. <laughs> and if I recall, you you so for those who don't know, you spent. You did you uh you spent your your college years at the Air Force Academy and then got an inter-service transfer. But mm -hmm. I if I don't if I recall correctly, during your bud speech, you said that you spent seven of eight semesters at the Air Force Academy on academic probation. Six, but yes. Oh, oh six, yeah. Sorry, yeah. I didn't mean to didn't mean to exaggerate. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to make you sound like uh worse than you were. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I struggled, man. I struggled so much at, the, at that place. Um, yeah, I, it, it was hard for me. So that, and that's such an interesting question because here you are, you went to have a, a, fin a fantastic career. And I think, you know, now you're in a, in a corporate role with, with Katsu. And, and I think that's a, a, an interesting point to bring up is we, we look at guys and go, Oh, well, let me look at your, your resume. And the resume doesn't really tell you anything. If, if you looked at my resume, it would say I dropped out of college to go become an enlisted sailor. Uh, you were on mm -hmm. academic probation, but you went on to have a, a story career. How do, uh, how do, how do hiring managers reconcile that? How do they look past like, Hey, you gotta look past what, what's just in the resume. That's yeah, we're, we're going to start don't. really deep. A lot of them don't, they, 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 they just won't even, won't even go there a lot of them. But, but I think the good ones will, uh, dig, dig, dig a little deeper. If you get turned down by an organization that hasn't done a face to face chat with you, you don't want to work there anyway, man. You know, it's a good point. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's not all about, it's not all about academics. That's for sure. Yeah. I mean, it, it is some about academics, but, um, <laughs> you know, but academics is a loose term. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll 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 take a guy that is academically average or even below average if he does things and even let's say he's only OK, only OK grades and with all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And let's say he did things, failed, but learned from his mistakes along the way. I think a guy like that is more valuable than, uh, you know straight a student never gets anything wrong maybe hasn't learned very many lessons the hard way because he didn't make any mistakes early on and then when the cards are really all down and and he makes a mistake and he doesn't kind of know how to deal with it you know different guys have different perspectives on it my perspective is obviously academics is is pretty low on the priority of of uh, the values you want to put on guys you bring into the into the organization it's yeah, just my sure. perspective a lot of guys would argue with that but you know whatever <laughs> yeah give me a guy who struggled to get c's at at harvard over a, a guy who got uh, maybe straight A's at some elite school a guy who was just he knows what it means to grind and and get after it right i think yeah yeah i mean i, I mean some guys are just naturally gifted uh at, at academics you know? Let me, uh, for our listeners who we're already well into it, but for our listeners who don't know, let me let me just read a, just a, a snapshot. Uh, John is a retired SEAL captain. Uh, that's a that's a colonel equivalent for you, Army and and Marine and Air Force Bubba's. Retired SEAL captain for 25 plus years, including a last stint as a director of the SOCOM Preservation of the Force and Family Initiative, uh, co-founder of the National Frogman Swim Series, 
You're a public speaker. You're an advisor to the National Foundation of Integrative Medicine on veteran health issues. And uh, and you are the chief revenue officer at uh, Katsu as well. Yes, sir. Have you have you ever thought about trying to be successful in life? <laughs> maybe, hey, maybe taking on a challenge just, every now and again. Hey, just surround yourself with with good dudes like you, man. You just surround yourself with good guys, and, and amazing stuff happens. You know. Hey, uh, take me back through a little bit through the journey. I want to because I, I I mean I've been following you for for 25 years since you come in, but but again we 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 go our separate ways, and I just hear your name pop up every now and again. Um, so you leave Buds. You and I, we graduated pre 9-11. The first couple of years we're in, we're, we're trying to kind of figure out what the, the purpose of the of the teams is. Uh, 9-11 hits. Wh- where are you? And then sort of what, what happened to your career from there? To, and, and what did it did it just what did it change night and day from from one week to the next? Um, I, I I'm sure every team guy you, that you ask that question to, you get a, you know, completely different. Uh, answer but I, I it changed in my opinion it just it just changed everything man um we were uh it was seal team two uh platoon uh we were split in half so we had half a platoon call it a platoon plus in kosovo so we were at camp bond steel yeah um president bush had just been out there uh, so we had done a uh, kind of counter sniper, counter assault, kind you know, help the Secret Service. Yeah. Um, great, great gig. Um, you know, all, a bunch of special agents came out, and we just hung out with those guys for two weeks before he got there. And uh, just such a gracious leader and great, 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 great deal. And then uh, so he left. So we went back to um, – you know, it was reconnaissance missions. It was uh, confirmed, deny movement of people uh, and or weapons across mo- mostly the Serbian uh, border. This and is in the fall of 2001. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, President Bush left and then we went back into the recce mode and we were doing stuff, Ma- Macedonia border, Albania border. But most of our focus seemed to be the Serbian border at that time. Sure. Um, and we were on a three day op, um, came back, we're all tired and, uh, I'm, I'm out cold, man. I, you know, I'm just in my, in my rack and, um, I'm in the chew there and I guess, uh, tiny, I'll leave his name out, but you know exactly who I'm talking about. Yeah. I guess tiny came and banged on my door and no answer, no answer comes in yelling at me. I'm out. I'm out, picks up my bed, you know, picks up the head of my bed, like three feet off the ground. And he's just like, (laughs) drops it. And he's like, sir, get up. We're going to war. And he walks out. And I was like, what? No shit. I get up. um, I walk into the Bond Steel, you know, (laughs) there, there was a CNN feed delayed on AFN, like aluminum foil antennas going out the door. I mean, it was a mess, but we did have a little TV and I walk in and guys were just starting to filter in and everybody's standing around this little TV watching what was happening. It wasn't even live. It was probably delayed like half hour or something. And, um, and the tower was burning. Yeah. And we're, we're as, as we're all kind of gathering around watching, going, whoa, what? OK, so there was an accident. A plane yeah. went into and then there were about 15 of us all watching at the same time when the second plane hit. And uh, it was like, OK, game on. And uh, every, everything changed. And but as uh, actually funny story, you know, at Bond Steel, it's an army base, right? Yeah. And so, so the towers come down and, uh, and we still, you know, it's coming up on lunch and, uh, the announcement goes out, everybody will, you know, everybody on base anywhere will have a, a primary secondary, at least the secondary, but they wanted everybody to have primary sector everywhere they go to include the chow hall. Yeah. So the chow hall at Camp Bond Steel uh the chairs on the chow hall are these rounded plastic thing there's no like hooks there's nowhere to lean a weapon like rifle 
so all these Joes are walking in with loaded weapons, right? I mean, chambered rounds, loaded weapons. Some of these guys have never care or barely ever carried a loaded weapon, right? So we're all <laughs> in there at lunch. The towers just came down. Everybody's just chatty. Nobody knows what it all means. Yeah. Um, all the entry control points are like, you know, quadruple guarded. Everybody's yeah. on edge. And <laughs> I remember I'm standing I'm standing in line, get like a piece of pizza or something. And I'm standing right behind Eric and we're just chatting away, chatting away. And all of a sudden, crack! Everybody hits the deck. It's like, what the fuck? Everybody's guns are up and everybody's like, the, we're platoon, every, guys are moving to the door and all that. <laughs> and then you hear, you hear across the chow hall, AD, AD. I'm like, what? Guy who dropped his rifle wasn't on safe and cracked a round off in the chow hall. Holy shit. Yeah. So, so then we're like, Oh, okay. That, uh, that was exciting. All right. He, well, he watched too many. Uh, what was it? Uh, uh, Black Hawk down. This is my safety. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay. Watched too many episodes. Well, at dinner that night, same thing, <laughs> same thing. Another Joe's rifle falls on the ground, cracks off around, or he hit it when he was getting his his fruit juice or you know whatever. So they <laughs> bonds it. And like, he's all right. <laughs> that's it. To be clear, no these are just chamber, no more chambered rounds. <laughs> these are these are army bubbas who just you know who might be working intel or something and have never been like carried a rifle like on a day to day basis and now they've just been in a span of thirty minutes they went from being an army like just an army intel guy or supply guy to now being strapped with a weapon everywhere they go. Is that right? Yeah, but to be fair, um, I I I don't know if it was oh. an army guy. I mean, it's oh. an army base. I mean, it could have been a Navy Intel guy for all I know. The point, yeah, yeah. the point being sure. that nobody was thinking like that. Nobody's walking around with with loaded weapons and stuff. I mean, it was Kosovo. It was Bond Steel. You could jump, you could jump in the jeep and drive drive up to Pristina, and go hang out with the Norwegians, and have good vodka or something. I mean, it it was an operational deployment, but. Very little shooting going on. It's just recce stuff, watching people and stuff. So it was a, it was um, immediately a big, uh, big wake up call. L- little, uh-huh. very little shooting going on outside of the, of the chow hall. Yeah, oh, yeah. It, good, good one, Jonathan. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's right. <laughs> yeah, outside the chow hall, there was very little shooting going. On. <laughs> perfect. That's perfect. <laughs> but that's where I was, man. Where, where were you? Um. I had just gotten out off of active duty and, uh, I was, uh, I just started back to college and, uh, I was going back to finish up school. Uh, it started in uh, late, late August. And then, uh, I had just finished terminal leave and, uh, like just finished terminal leave uh, like 30 days before. And, uh, I, 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 my buddy up in New York calls me. He's like, dude, I'm okay. And I was like, okay, all right, sounds good. And, He's like, no, do you not know what's going on? I was like, nah, man, I, I don't have class for like another half hour. It's just kind of my own world. And he's like, holy shit, you got to turn on the TV. And I turned it on. And then I, you know, this is, I'm going back. I was, I, I had whatever my old flip phone was. I started texting guys and, and every, and the same thing. Team guys were just getting wrapped around the axle. Like, holy shit, we're going to war. It's mm-hmm. interesting how quickly, how, how quickly we became very aware of the fact that we're going to war. And, and if we had more time, I'd go back and talk about to, uh, tiny stories because uh, because your description of Tiny coming in. And uh, so for those of you who are listening who don't know uh, who Tiny is, he earned the name Tiny for, for obvious uh, irony reasons. And uh, the, the guy was just a monster of a human being. Uh, still is. St- it still <laughs> is. Yeah, I haven't seen him. It's been it's been a minute since I've seen him. But uh, yeah, coming in and flipping over his lieutenant out of bed is probably with one arm while he had a beer in the other is pro- probably... That's probably a, a tiny kind of uh, story. Um, but so so that happens. You finish up the deployment. Take us through like not not in 30 seconds, but you, you had a story career, which finally led you to the preservation of force and family, which I really want to talk about a, a little bit as well. And, and also talk about what you're doing with Katsu and, and the, the Tampa Bay swim. But um, there, there's so much we could unpack in, in just what you did from the in the 20 years from there till when you ultimately retired, just you come back from that deployment and did you guys stay on that deployment? We did. 
we did. And, uh, you know, I look, looking back on it, it all made sense, but it all makes sense. But back at the time, we, you know, we, we, we were excited. It's not the right uh, word, but, uh, you know, everybody was just fired up. Everybody wanted to go oh. and be part of it. And we were on a predetermined ops yeah. schedule out of, yeah. out of deployment with <laughs> exercise bright star. I like to call it dim star uh, out in Egypt. And I was like, hey, there's no way they're going to send us to dim star. I mean, we're going we're going to war. Let's go. Yeah. And, you know, I, I realize now how much goes into one of these multinational giant exercises yeah. <laughs> but you know back then I, I i could i was really frustrated i was like come on send us we're here we're overseas yeah we're in the middle east basically i mean we're in egypt and um but it didn't work out that way so we finished our deployment uh on schedule uh went back to uh yeah went back to team two and at this point other guys are already boots on ground in, yes, in Afghanistan and you guys are like we're doing fucking exercises while our while our brothers are getting after it yeah 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 that 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 was a tough pill to swallow collectively yeah um, trying to keep morale up I suspect was a, a, a challenge right yeah well we had tiny for that so that was fine. <laughs> <laughs> jack of all trades <laughs> so I think you got unique insight you were uh, was it two or three years you did at the at socom mm-hmm. at, at, in the poda for all yeah so yeah. so correct me if i'm wrong poda the the preservation of the force and family exists because socom at some point recognized hey we're our guys are get are suffering from a lot of wear and tear not just physically but but emotionally socially mentally Right. Yeah. Psychologically, physiologically, uh, they're suffering and the families are suffering, too. So SOCOM creates this this uh, this initiative. Um, now, you're coming as a director that and that was like what, like 15, 16, 17, 20, 2015, 2016. Yeah, yeah 15 through 17. That, that's about right, because I retired 17. So, so yeah, and I was in there a little over yeah, a little under three years. So you come in at a point where we've been at war for 15 years. We've in fact, we've morphed from al-qaeda to now to an isis fight so you've seen sort of two different adversaries and just but yeah. the op tempo um you said we're you know we're kind of a bad place and i don't think it's i think the seal teams are suffering um or at least we are aware of it because of 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 our our you know our connection there but i think the the veteran community writ large is really suffering the 22 a day we're at lots of of issues I think we've seen a little bit more of an uptick since we left Afghanistan. At least that's been my 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 anecdotal observation. Mm -hmm. Do you think now, ha, from having been in the preservation of the force and family initiative, why is that? Why are we seeing an uptick? Is it is it a a loss of sense of purpose? Is it is it just is it all coming to bear because we're not at war anymore? Why do you think that is? Well, first of all, I think um, we've never as a country been in this scenario. We've never been in a combat, sustained combat operations. And I would argue we are still today in sustained combat operations, yeah. especially in SOF, in Special Operations Force. Yeah. But we've never done anything remotely near this, getting after it for over two decades. And when you look at this 22 a day, and you talk to guys that are, uh, you know, senior guys in the VA, they'll tell you that if you look at the average number, a lot of that number comes from uh, Vietnam veterans, actually. And you look at the average number of deployments uh, in Vietnam, and it was two. So you had the guys that did the draft, and that was one. But then you had guys that did Mike Troy, my, one of my mentors growing up, uh, team guy, he did three tours in Vietnam. And the average is somewhere in the twos, right? And then you look at what we have now, and uh, I mean, my buddy Job, when he died by suicide in 2012, he was on his 14th deployment, right? 14 yeah. deployments. And that was 11 years ago. And we're still going. So there's definitely an argument that um, we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg on on all of this. And you ask why? Um, I don't know. But what I do know 
is we have collectively had some success with um, helping make it incrementally better. And that's what the POTIF program did. We took, and, 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 and Admiral Olson, Eric Olson, and Admiral McRaven, Bill McRaven, the, but between the two of them succeeded in getting congressional support for money to hire resources, people resources. So think yeah. of a giant, giant uh, personal services contract Right. It was with Booz Allen initially and hiring licensed clinical social workers, operational psychologists, counselors, strength and conditioning coaches, trainers, operational psychs, sports psychs, uh, uh, nutritionists, sports nutrition, all this all this capability and then strategically dropping these resources into operational commands. Almost immediately what started happening, because if you were going to go see, if you had somebody working for you and and you knew they needed help, yeah. how did they, how did you get them help? You, you mm. encouraged them to go to the clinic or to go to the base hospital or whatever medical treatment facility yeah. was on your base or near your base, or if you didn't have an MTF, then encouraging them to please go and and get go see a professional outside the the base that shit doesn't work it it just plain doesn't work it might work in certain elements of the military in special operations didn't work guys would do it i mean you had a couple guys do it but guys for the most part they wouldn't do it And the idea was, well, let's let's start embedding these resources immediately uh, into the commands. So think of um, a guy at, at a soft command. He's walking down the hall and he sees, I don't know, senior enlisted advisor, the command master chief, let's say, talking to a counselor in the hall. Or they see uh, one of the senior TU commanders going into an office where they, the counselor's office and shutting the door, right? Yeah. Or or counselors and psychologists using the same chow hall or using the same gym and sharing space, right? Almost yeah. immediately, this this trust is, get gets built, and the stigma, you know that word, yeah, right? yeah, stigma of seeking care and all that, it, it becomes a different conversation, and then. It really helped, man, when we, when we had like somebody like General Votel come into the overall SOCOM enterprise and say, hey, you know what? You break a leg, you go and see a doc. Yeah. You, 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 you are exposed to a lot of trauma. You go and see somebody. It's, it, 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 it's apples and apples, man. You get, you get parts of you get broken. You got to go get fixed. And so a lot of the leadership embraced that. And uh, we started seeing um, um, improved outcomes. I, I'm I'm real careful to say improved outcome because it's still everywhere, brother, and it's bad, man. It is yeah. bad. You you mentioned uh, Joe Price, so commanding officer of SEAL Team Four, Bobby Ramirez, recent uh, commanding officer of SEAL Team One, Jack Keller, who was another officer. Uh, not to trivialize the deaths of, of anybody else enlisted or otherwise, but when you have, um, but when you have senior officers who everybody else thinks has it together. And when those guys mm, yeah. hit a wall yeah. where they, they take their own lives is that it's, it's not that their deaths are any more tragic, but does that speak volumes about where, where we are in terms of, of the stress that the, that the, uh, the community or and just the veteran community at writ large must be feeling if if the guys that we expect to have it all together or or are we or am i or am i putting too no, much no i think you're exactly it? right exactly man i mean think okay so joe joe price inner service transfer just like me 93 uh usafa air force grad i was a 92 oh, no guy we knew each other in school i didn't know that it's just an old old brother and yeah. uh Old friend, brother, but yeah. So this is, he, he's an old friend of mine. And um, 
he was kind of known in the community as the first hand to go up in the room when they were looking for somebody to volunteer to, you know, hey, we need we need an augment for this JSOC thing. It just that that this guy can't go. I'll go. Joe, Joe, he would do it all the time. Um, he was incredible leader, uh, incredibly hard worker, maybe too hard sometimes. And um, my takeaway from his situation is, and this is getting to your point, I think it if it can happen to him, yeah, one of are arguably one of the most resilient mm-hmm. guys I, I knew um or or so i thought but if it can happen to him it can happen to freaking anybody and i i think about this a lot because i go and i talk to these rotc units i go to the service academies i talk to these 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 cadets and midshipmen and stuff and um it it's just a realization that everybody's got a breaking point if, if you think you're so tough and you'll you'll never break that was joe man I'm sure it was the same with Bobby. I'm sure it was the same with a lot of these guys. But you take the the the, the cumulative sub concussive concussion TBI stuff. You take the blast exposure. You take the um, uh, repetitive stress events and not giving the human body the time to recover from all those cumulative events. Because Jonathan, when when you and I came in, it used to be. 18 months workup, six month deployment, right? Yeah, right. In, in general, like a three to one. Yeah. Yeah. The 9 11 happens in that 18 months of professional development, leave, a uh, personal time, unit training, collaboration training with the Marines or whoever you're working. All that 18 months gets squeezed into like six months, really. In that six months, the guys were gone a lot because we didn't have training venues near to teams and stuff. And and so, so what was a 24 month cycle became a 12 month cycle. And of that 12 months, six months of it was in a lot of cases combat a lot. Yeah. And in the other six months, um, they weren't home a whole lot. And when they were home, they were just stressed out of their gold because they had so much shit going on. Yeah. So. I think everybody can handle that once, twice, thrice, you know, Joe did it 14 times. Guys have done it more, but at some point the wheels come off the bus, man. I don't care who you are. And, uh, I mean, look at, look at Bobby, man. I mean, man, that was just, it's crazy. It's crazy, man. Yeah. And then Mike just recently, um, I don't know how you when this will come out, but I mean, you know, Mike Day, April 2007. I mean, what an amazing, amazing man that yeah. he what he survived through and just an American hero, dude. And then the here that it ended uh, with him this uh, this week with him dying by suicide. I, I, I we all know we everybody can't re- wrap their head around it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So everybody's got an opinion. Um, my opinion is blast exposure, TBI, disrupted sleep, getting stuck in hypervigilance, getting stuck. You know, you got your parasympathetic and your sympathetic. Yeah. A lot of guys, and I was one of them, I had to go get treated for it. I did this inpatient thing and da, da, da. But a lot of guys, it's very normal. You get exposed so for me, I came back from a Ghazni deployment in Afghanistan. That was a one-year deployment. And uh, I don't think I had PTSD from the one-year deployment. I think I had PTSD from the Army training to go on that deployment. <laughs> but anyway, so but I'm they, gone. They... Yeah, so so I'm gone from my family for 15 months. You know, my middle son, he always reminds me, you missed my birthday twice on one deployment. I was like, okay. Uh. But you come off these kind of, I think hypervigilance is a good term. That kind of makes sense, right? You you, you, you yeah. come back from that, and uh, it's just really hard to get out of that cycle. So you'll hear a lot of guys, and I was one of them, three o'clock in the morning, you're up, boom. Yeah. And then the wheels are turning, you can't go back down. And you do all the sleep hygiene stuff. You do, you do everything that you can to get 
into recovery sleep, stage three, stage four sleep. And a, for a lot of times, it's just physically impossible to do it without some help. And I needed help. And I didn't see nearly the combat that 90% of the guys in the teams that were in the same time saw. Yeah. And I, and I, and I had some problems with it. I had to get professional help to come out of that, um, mode. I couldn't sleep past three in the morning. It was just, and that's physical torture over time. Right. I can't help but think that that is all over the place. I think, I think a lot of guys are struggling with that. I know it. I know for it. sure. For how's sure. your sleep? How's your sleep, man? Oh, it sucks. <laughs> it sucks. I, uh, yeah. Hyper vigilance. And it's funny. I, I, I went to see a, a therapist and I, I'm very open about it and, and, uh, with, you know, my PTSD diagnosis and stuff, but, um, I, I went to see a, uh, a sleep specialist and, and, uh, and, and just, a uh, uh, a behavioral therapist about what, mm-hmm. and she was asking me about like my thing. She's like, well, do you, she's like, you know, do, are you hyper aware? I was like, no, I don't, I don't think so. And then she asked me like these very like pointed questions, dude, do you do this? Do you do this? And I was like, uh, well, yeah, of course I do that. Yeah. And she was like, well, like, do you, do you, when you think about going into a crowd, do you, are you, do you get concerns about like, I'm like, well, of course I do. Like, doesn't, doesn't everybody. And she's like, no, not everybody does. <laughs> I'm like, wait, what? Yeah, exactly. And so it, it was almost, it was almost comical how I had this epiphany. I was like, wait a minute. You mean the rest of the world doesn't operate there like this? She's like, when you go to bed at night, if you lock the doors and you wake up, do you go check the locks again? I was like, well, yeah, for sure. She's like, but you already checked them. I was like, yeah, you can never be too safe, I guess. She's like, how many times a week do you do it? I'm like, I don't know. I guess every night. <laughs> yeah. And she's yeah. like, that's yeah. Yeah. not yeah. normal. I'm like, it's not. Yeah. No. It's, it's, it's normal when you spend a career in that world, <laughs> but it's not normal. Right. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. You, uh, you mentioned like, uh, mental well-being, but it is it, sort of embedded in a lot of the stuff you talked about was that physical well-being and and keeping in physical shape and what kind of benefit it has. And I know that's what you're doing with, with Katsu. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you ended up there and sort of like, I, I know you're a big believer. I follow your stuff on LinkedIn. Um, mm-hmm. and I know mm-hmm. it's a, it's, it's a pretty innovative, uh, approach to, to physical fitness stuff. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, well, I think, I think the mental and physical is very, very closely tied together. I spent a lot of time at SOCOM with really smart guys in that world, you know, PhD researchers. Yeah. And it there's plenty of research showing direct correlation, correlations, cause and effect with the, the, the behavioral health and the physical health and how they affect each other. Um, but I had, uh, I had 13 orthopedic surgeries and the last two – that I had at SOCOM, uh, the PTs um, used this thing called Katsu on me. And that was my introduction to it. I had no idea what it was. They looked like tourniquets. And I was like, what? why am I going to put a tourniquet on? What's that going to do? Isn't that <laughs> what we use for surgery? No, 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 man. This is different. And it is different. They're, uh, they're elastic pneumatic bands. The guys wear them up high on their arms. Uh, they wear them up high on their legs. I just happened to have one of the devices. Total, here. total coincidence. <laughs> yeah, total coincidence. But I mean, the, the the controller is 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 pretty small, right? I mean, and you just you wear this thing on your uh, on your shorts or whatever, and it creates 30 seconds of pressure on the elastic airband, and during the pressure phase, you got we, you're creating a hypoxic environment for the limb when it's moving like that, but you're also creating uh, uh, improved blood flow, systemic blood flow everywhere else. So, so think about this for a second. If you have these, if you have these bands on, and and all, and the heart is having to pump harder to get the blood to move past the band. Sure. It's not just pumping there harder. It's pumping everywhere harder. 
So while you're doing katsu, think of blood brain barrier, think of blast exposure, TBI and all this stuff now. So while the perfusion goes up and the heart is pumping so much harder to get blood to the extremities, you're getting improved blood flow, retina, forehead, blood brain barrier. And you know, we've shown this in EKGs and functional MRIs and all this. And um, so Mm. from a wounded warrior perspective, it has the ability to to help and you can get good metabolic outcome like a good workout pump or feel and the science will show a hormonal response like if you right now did um you know just did heavy deadlifts right there at the bar by the way i love that at your bar <laughs> if, if you had a bar right there and you did, I don't know, just called 225 deadlifts, and then you went to fail failure, right? Yeah. I, I would imagine, you know, whatever. You get, let's say you get the 12 of them, you're completely smoke checked, right? Okay. okay. With Katsu, you would put the leg bands on and you would let it th- run through these cycles of pressure. So 30 seconds of pressure, five seconds of nothing. 30 seconds, a little higher pressure, five seconds of nothing. And instead of deadlifting 225, you deadlift just the bar, like 45 pounds. And instead of doing 12, you do 20 or 30, maybe as many as 40. But you're going really, really light. Yeah. But it feels very quickly after you get to about number 15, it feels like you're doing that 225, if not more. And you're getting that hormonal response as if you're going heavy. So it's crazy. You're tricking the brain into thinking you're working harder than you are. That's why the PTs like it. Because a guy like me, a guy like you, you have a shoulder rotator cuff repair. After two weeks, you feel pretty good. You're ready to go. And they're like, no, 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 man, you're not ready to go. Don't go too heavy on it. Well, this is a way to not go heavy, but still get a good metabolic outcome. So the guys love it because they feel like they're getting after it. But they're actually saving their bodies from injury. Or if you're in rehab mode, you know, you're you can get a great workout with very low weight. And um, so my last two surgeries, they they used it on me. I fell in love with it. I was getting ready to get out anyway. Uh, went out to Tokyo uh, where the founder lives. And yeah. he's been developing this stuff for decades since uh, the early 70s. And uh, I met him. Uh, I met our CEO, and long story longer, uh, I've been working there ever since, man. I've, I absolutely love it. It's something that I use on myself every day, multiple times a day. And and you don't have to be working out with it. Like when I get up and do more emails in the morning, I got it on, and I'm doing stuff. Really? Because even in a passive mode, you're still creating what's called um, nitric oxide. So every time you dilate tissue and relax it, Every time that happens, your body is naturally releasing nitric oxide. It's endothelial nitric oxide synthase or something like that. It's crazy. Um, But it improves vascular health or or elasticity of your veins and arteries. So it's good for you. Your blood pressure over time uh, goes down. If you're diabetic, it helps with that. There's there's a lot of uh, cool stuff. But um, I think that for me, the best part is working with the uh, the wounded guys, especially the residual limb uh, pain and discomfort and phantom limb pain and guys that have amputations. Um, yeah, it's helping those guys a lot. That's awesome. That's incredible work, man. I uh, all right. So k a k a a t s u dot com, right? Yep, katsu dot com. And what I'll also say is, if you're listening to this and you're a member of the special operations community, a veteran member of the, or active, if you're, if you ever were or are currently a member of special operations community and you're struggling with neuropathic pain or orthopedic issues or arthritic issues, um, and there's even a sleep piece that the Olympic committee is using this stuff for, um, we don't need to go too deep and all that. But if you have disrupted sleep, you, or any of that other stuff, and you're, uh, th- there's a way we, we can get units for you. We work uh, very closely with an awesome, awesome nonprofit. 
Um, of course, we work with the SEAL Foundation, but that's just inside the teams. Um, Operation is my little plug for these guys. Uh, Operation Healing Forces, um, OHF. What they do is they send couples on retreats. Yeah. Have you heard about this? I, I've only heard about them. Oh, my wife and I did one, and it was probably the the the, the best just one on one time we had since ever since our and we we got married in 2000. So and this was in the middle of COVID. So you know, best thing we done since our honeymoon. So over 20 really? years. And they and they cover everything, man. They fly you to some cool place, and you're in a cohort. So there's four, four soft guys and spouses, okay, and everything's covered. And it's not all about like counseling and all that. It's about doing fun shit together, stuff yeah, that yeah. you haven't had a chance to do in a really long time. And um, there is a uh, there's something that happens naturally when you have four spouses and four um, operators together for a week, it becomes its own kind of really powerful therapy in a way. There's no, there's no counseling. There's no professional running it as a, as, a, as a professional psych or something. So anyway, that's incredible. It's called OHF. If you've never been on one, look those guys up and just get yourself on the ticker, man. It's, it's incredible. But they, we partnered with them. And um, when they have guys that are dealing with, you know, pretty bad sleep issues, yeah. neuropathic pain or whatever, um, they'll work with us and and they'll get this this stuff for the, for the guys. So it's it's pretty cool. I do want to ask you about because I know you were one of the uh, co-founders of it, and I've been following it for a number of years. The Tampa Bay Frog uh, Frogman Swim, which has now morphed into the what is it National Frogman Swim Series. Um, mm-hmm. You started right. it. This was just an idea that you and, and a buddy had to just swim across the Tampa Bay, right? To yeah. try and so, raise so, money for the Navy SEAL Foundation, right? Yeah. So, so to be clear, because Dan, Dan will yell at me, uh, I, I didn't come up with the idea. <laughs> but I was I was at the first one, and it was all about Dan Canossi. You know Dan? I, uh, I, I know who he is. I don't know him. Yeah, dual, dual amputee above the knee. Olympian, uh, right? Yeah, Afghanistan, <laughs> ID, low order, loses both, both legs. Um just God, incredible individual. Just I've never his attitude. You know, we talk about attitude all the time. Yeah. You got bad attitude. You got a good attitude. It's all contagious. That dude, I wish we could bottle him up and ship him to every single high school in America and just and just let him talk and just just let him run with it. Because, I mean, I want to say it was like. He's at Walter Reed and he's there for, I don't know, 10 days, two weeks or something like that. It, apparently, they put a pull up bar above his bed <laughs> because he wanted to get after it after losing his legs. And then they release him from Walter Reed. He comes down to Florida. And, and this, this is within two months of losing both legs. And he does the uh, uh, Disney half marathon. And it's just like, what? And then he goes to Pyeongchang to Winter Olympics and medals and everything he enters in with little to no background in those sports. I mean, just amazing, amazing. But the first swim was about him. It, it was about uh, raising some resources to to help uh, the Kanasan family. And our goal was to just make a couple thousand dollars. There's about 25 of us. We uh, agreed to do something cool. I honestly don't know who came up with the idea, okay? But it ended up being over beers, let's swim across Tampa Bay. Like a most short- good ideas, just to do a, like whatever, an eight-mile yeah. swim. They just come across over beers. Yeah. And at the end of the swim, we're at the American Legion on the Tampa side. And uh, so start in St. Pete and on the Tampa Peninsula, same peninsula SOCOM's on. And, uh, and, and, and we're adding up all the, you know, the checks and little wads of cash coming out of people's pockets, little IOUs written on bar napkins and stuff. And we added it all up and, uh, the number was like $30,000 and, wow. and we were shooting for like three to five and we're like, wait a minute, what the hell's going on here? And, um, and then I left, uh, I went on deployment and then I was stationed over in Germany. And then, uh, and, and then when I came home 
the swim had turned into a uh, a, a full blown fundraiser for the Navy SEAL Foundation. Um, and uh, they asked me if I want to be part of it, like on the board and stuff. I was like, hell yeah. But here's the thing. I really feel strongly that this swim, just like it was for a, a specific cause on that first one, that we should we should really galvanize it for something, not just in general to one of the foundations. But uh, how about the Gold Star um, surviving spouses and, and kids? Um I didn't come up with that idea, but that that was what was discussed when I was over and uh, when I was gone. And uh, so now the swim is it raises money for the Navy SEAL Foundation. Uh, it's all basically earmarked for the Gold Star family. So what happens is the swim, the Gold Star families last this last January, we had 25 families, about 75 people from 25 gold star families were there and each year it grows and each year the resources that we bring in for the foundation uh grows and it's it it's it's incredible man and now we've expanded it out there's um uh one in boston now uh there'll be another one in uh, new york uh annapolis is uh getting close i think um and so it's turned into this swim series and um it, 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 the, the guy at the middle of it all, and he's going to hate me for saying it, but I got it, man. Norm Ott's son, uh, Kurt Ott, is really the guy that has spearheaded this and made it something very special. And when you get out of you, when you get out of the water, and there's a Gold Star family member. For me, this year, it was uh, Joe Price's sister standing there oh, wow. uh, waiting for me. Takes, you know, it's a coin, puts it around my neck, big hug. But everybody that does the swim is swimming it for a fallen NSW since 9-11. Yeah. So, and, and to include the suicides, because uh, I, I, I firmly believe that the suicides are a uh, natural or unnatural outcome of prolonged uh, combat that the guys are being exposed to. So the swim is it's just freaking incredible man it is one of the coolest things to be part of if you if you ever want to uh, uh swing down for it i'll i'll uh yeah it'll, it'll be cool man i'll get get you in you can swim with me or something uh john i have swam with you i spent six months swimming with you and uh <laughs> we started in the water together and you usually finished uh oh i don't know 45 minutes ahead of me and that's that oh that's not true it wasn't that bad <laughs> well, it wasn't that far off um <laughs> can you explain it has been a long time can you explain what is happening in this photograph right here i believe See? we're hydrating right before hell week maybe uh <laughs> I uh when I when I knew I was gonna be interviewing Actually, you, I went that, was on, that must have been on the island, man. That, that was. Was that on the island? We had just finished, so we're at the end of buds. We're getting ready to come back and graduate a week later. So this is literally one week before we graduated from uh from buds. And there's uh and it's Marco Signorello, you, me. Yeah, I grabbed a uh it, I almost, grabbed a, it almost looks like there might have been alcohol involved. I, I think there may have been. Yeah, this is uh <laughs> yeah, I grabbed a couple from the. I had to go back into the Wayback Machine and grab a couple. Uh, yeah, you'll oh, see. Oh, uh, dude, Mikey yeah. Bearden, holy code right? yellow! Oh man. Yeah, yeah. Hey, well, there's there's big there. there's big Jack Carr on the far right there. I was just gonna say. <laughs> I, I was gonna say Jack Carr, who's going on to do good things, right? Yeah, there's a there's a bunch of guys that have gone on to do uh, some pretty good things there. Danny, yeah. uh, Rick Doggett. And then the final last one for the throwback machine is uh, you giving a brief with uh, with Ryan Clapper there before our. Um, so for anybody else tuning in going, why the hell is he showing these things? Because this is uh, this goes back 25 years. For those who don't know, uh, Bud's class 213, the, the hardest class uh, at the then Lieutenant John Doolittle was my uh, was my class officer for uh for my buds class and this is the first time we've chatted in, in probably probably 20 years it's been it's been two decades man yeah it's at been, least it's been a long it's been a long time yeah and you gotta you dude 
you got to scan me those pictures, man. That that that's incredible. I don't I have it. Where'd you get those? I don't have any. I know. I know. I, I don't. I had to go into the vault and uh, <laughs> and pull. And I was looking at it. And honestly, God, when I found this one of uh, of you, me, and Sig, I was like, ah, that's perfect. <laughs> that's perfect of Sig, man. <laughs> Yeah, I have. Uh, I actually have we photos. All, we all look the exact same, man. We, we're it's identical, almost, almost identical, minus a few pounds, a few gray hairs. <sighs> yeah. But yeah. up up here, I'm still the same guy. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You've you've done awesome, man. It's it's great to be linked back up back up with you. Likewise, bud. So, uh, hey, where uh, where can folks find you on the interweb? Uh, well, I'm on LinkedIn. That's probably my, I don't know how effective LinkedIn is, but that seems to be where I interact the most with people. So I just use that. Um, I have John, a website. Yeah, just John Doolittle. If you just type in uh, John Doolittle on LinkedIn, um, you know, Frogman Swim, Seal, NSW, you know, whatever, it'll 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 come up. There's only, yeah. yeah, there's only a couple on there. And then I have a, uh, a website. I do I do a fair amount of pro bono uh, public speaking, johndoolittle.com. So just one word, johndoolittle.com. And um, what I what I say on that thing is, if especially if you're if you run an ROTC uh, organization or you're one of the service academies or you're one of the, I love talking to college age. Uh, kids, especially those that are going into service, a service of some sort. But I like talking to all all colleges, man. So uh, and that's pro bono stuff. Some of them insist on paying. And if that's the case, uh, I use it to cover my travel and the rest goes to the UDT SEAL Association, the guys that do the reunion yeah. uh, and the magazine and the blast and stuff. Um, but yeah, so. Very cool, man. Well, hey, we appreciate all that you're doing to give back to the veteran community and to take care of the guys. And uh, thanks for sharing about the Katsu with us, man. I, I think uh, for those who are looking for ways to to ease some of the pain, not just the emotional pain we talked about, but the physical pain, uh, I think it's uh, it's worth checking out. I'm, I, I know I have a lot of clicking and a lot of actually tingling, and I'm, uh, I'm actually going to get in on I'm going to get on the website if you're here immediately after. So. John, thanks so much for joining us, man. And thanks for uh, for sharing your story with us. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Jonathan. It's been been a pleasure. Likewise, bud.